Well, let's do a few clicker questions before we get started. I don't think we've done any of these, have we, for chapter nine? Am I right about that? We have done some? We have not any. Okay, good. So we're good to go on some of these. One material has a higher density than another. Does that mean that the molecules must be more massive in the first one than in the second? Stop in about 10 seconds. Get your clickers out. We'll stop at 48. 48. Okay, awesome. B is right. Uh, just because the material has a higher density, it doesn't mean that the molecules themselves are more massive, though it could be in that, but not necessarily. It really means that the molecules are more closely packed most of the time. All right, I don't, can I get above 90% on that? Okay, let's see. Oh shoot, I had a good, like a good boomerang joke. I can't remember, what was it? Oh, it'll come back to me. Okay, consider what happens when you push a pin and the blunt end of a pin, like a writing pin, against your skin with the same force. What will determine whether your skin will be punctured? So you push like a sewing needle or a push pin with the same force as a writing pin. Stopping at 50. All right, A is right. Uh, a number of you put C as well. Remember that C, I mean that uh, pressure and force are not the same. In fact, pressure is force over area. And so, you know, you can push on your skin with a writing pen and it doesn't really do much to you. But if you push with the same force with a push pen, it's going to go into your skin. And the reason is because you have the same force, but with a push pen, you have a much smaller area. And it's going to puncture your skin, your skin because it has a higher pressure. You're walking out on a frozen lake. You begin to hear the ice cracking. What's your best strategy? This happens to y'all like every winter, doesn't it? Stop at uh, 45, 45. Okay, awesome. E is the right answer. You want to minimize your pressure since pressure is F over A. You can't change your force, right? Because that's just your weight. But if you spread it out, lying down face first or on your back and then crawling, then that makes a lower pressure because it increases A. Yeah, don't jump up and down. That's bad. All right. Sorry, every time I read this, it gives me the giggles. You swim near the bottom of the pool and you let out a small bubble of air. As the bubble rises towards the surface, what happens to its diameter? See, if y'all were in middle school, you would all be laughing right now. But you're not. You're adults and you're... <laughs> Oh, yeah, I don't get it, do you? <laughs> what 
happens to its diameter? All right, we'll stop at 50. 50. Okay, good. C is right. This is just like the video with the, the song by that guy with the dreadlocks. I don't remember his name. But uh, with a bottle, he takes it down to high pressure area and it collapses. And then when it comes back up, it, it expands again. So the same is true here for the, the bubble that you let out, that it will expand as it comes up. Because the pressure at, at shallower depths is lower than the pressure at deeper depths. Oh, what did the uh, what did the subatomic duck say? Quark. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, this one's tricky. Three containers are filled with water to the same height and have the same surface area at the base, but the total weight of water is different for each. Which container has the total greatest total force acting on its base? Actually, no, no, I don't like this question. I don't like it. Let's just, uh, we're going to say the answer is D, and I'll tell you why. But I'll also tell you why I don't think it's right. Um, so we're going to put D. All three are equal. Listen, this might be right if we were dealing just with one and two. That one and two should have the same pressure acting upon them, right? Um, because you have the same column of liquid that sits above the point. So here you have a column of liquid that's this high, and then somewhere over here you have a column of liquid that is this high. So even though you have this extra liquid, you still only have the column of liquid that sits above this area that's causing the pressure to act down upon that point. Just like you have a column of fluid that sits above your head that goes all the way up to the atmosphere, and that's where you get that one times 10 to the fifth newton per square meter, 100,000 newtons per square meter that acts upon you. Now here, you do have a column of liquid but that column actually gets smaller as you go up. So it, it has less volume than these other two. So the answer here is given as D, but really it should be uh, containers 1 and 2. You all follow what I'm saying? Because you have the same height of liquid for both of those. Right, but I'm going to count D is right. Hey, 100%. I was telling my wife the other day that it's like even when I tell them the answer, they don't get 100%. But now... You did. That's awesome. Because she said there's always one in every class. They just want to be different or whatever. All right. When a hole is made in the side of a can holding water, water flows out and follows a parabolic trajectory. If the can is dropped in free fall, the water flow will do which of these? Probably wouldn't encounter a problem like this on the test, but it's good. It's fun to think about anyway. If it's dropped in free fall, what will happen? Oh, good. Y'all doing pretty well. I'm going to stop in about 10 seconds. I'll stop at 45, actually. 45. Oh, 45. Okay, good. B is right. Uh, when you drop it, you'll have, there'll be no forces, that you'll have no difference in pressure from either side, and then that'll cause it just to stop flowing altogether. When you drink liquid through a straw, which of the items listed below is primarily responsible for this to work? Saw this last time in the, uh, you know, with Derek Muller. Uh, I'm going to stop at uh, 35, 
Awesome. That's great. D is right. Atmospheric pressure. Y'all talked about this at lunch the other day, didn't you? When you were drinking your Coke and you said, hey, do you know what's causing the straw to work? And then you made a 10 meter straw, did you? <laughs> no. All right, let's see. Uh, the flight attendant asked the photon if he had any bags to check. And then the photon said, nah, I'm traveling at light speed. OK, let's see. Atmospheric pressure. In which of these, how do these air pressures compare? This is one of those things. You ever do the snakes when you go out to a restaurant where you crinkle up your little paper from the straw and then you put it on the thing and you drop water on it and it all snakes out? Where you hold your finger over the straw. Well, this is you're holding your finger over your straw. I want to know what is the difference between this pressure P and then this pressure down here, P A. Let me pull that up, you can't see it. This pressure, which is the atmospheric pressure, and this pressure. What is the difference between them? Or how are they different? P and P A. All right, we will stop at 105, 105. I want you to also think about by what amount are they different. I'll show you that, but be thinking about that. Okay, good, C is right. This pressure right here is less than this pressure. And in fact, if we had a straw that was 10 meters long, this pressure would equal to zero. Right, that's like a mercury barometer. That's like the straw that we saw in a Veritasium video. So now I ask yourself a question, and not as a clicker, but what is the <laughs> value of the difference in pressure? That is, what is uh, P minus PA equal to? Or rather, PA minus P. Can we calculate what that difference in pressure is? Now remember, the difference in pressure, or the amount of pressure, the way that we measure pressure generally, there are various ways to measure pressure, but the main way we measure pressure is by measuring the height of a column of liquid. That's how you measure blood pressure. You get that little column of mercury that pops up. That tells you the pressure by what is the height of it. And so we would consider then the height of this liquid right here would tell us the difference in these two pressures. So we'd say rho times g times the height of this column. Not the height of this column, but the height of this column of liquid would tell us the difference in the pressures. Mercury barometer, the height of the column is 760 millimeters. You've heard that. That's one atmosphere of 760 millimeters of mercury. What if you took your barometer and you made it bigger, bigger in diameter? How would that affect the height of the column of mercury? All right, we'll stop at 42, 42, just guess if you're not sure. Okay, awesome. It's a good thing that the barometer doesn't depend upon the height, because then we'd have to standardize the diameter of the barometer. I'm sorry, I said height, I meant diameter. That if we change the diameter of our barometer, then it doesn't change the height of the column. And actually, if you think about the equation, when we look at a barometer, P is equal to rho times G times H. Notice that there's no mention of the diameter because it doesn't matter. The diameter cancels out. You can also think about, remember that little figure that we drew of the, the block sitting underneath this big column of liquid? The area canceled out because we did volume over area, and we were just left with the height of the column. So the area does not matter. It, it goes away. And so they would be exactly the same in this case. We'll just do a couple more here. Barometers never use alcohol, unlike you know, thermometers, which can use either alcohol or mercury. Why is this? Why do barometers, which measure pressure, never use alcohol? We have covered barometers, right? 
parameter is our manometer with P naught equal to zero. All right, and we will stop at 30, at 40. And then we'll go back to our notes. Uh, we have a clicker question back in the notes. So if you finish this one, go on back. Uh, we'll stop here at 40. Hey, and that's awesome. D is right. Uh, the reason we use it is because mercury is a lot more dense. In fact, you'd rather not use mercury when you're measuring pressure because mercury is just such a pain in the rear when you spill it. You got to get such a chemical to clean it up and you got to file a report. It's just a big old mess. So we much rather use alcohol. But if you used alcohol, it would be like 10 meters tall. Wait, no, it would be even more than 10 meters because alcohol is even less dense than water, as you found in the lab, right? It's like 0.8 something, I think, was the density of alcohol. And so if you were doing a barometer, it would need to be like 12, 13, 14 meters tall. It'd be a big old barometer. So D is the right answer. And we'll come back to this later. All right, let's try this one. It's on page 191. This has a manometer. You have atmospheric pressure on this side. We have methane on this side. And I want to know, it's at 37 Celsius. And I want to know what is the pressure of the methane. This is filled with mercury. I want to know what is this pressure of methane. First, you want to ask yourself the question of, is the methane more or a higher or a lower pressure than the atmospheric pressure? Is it higher or lower than methane? Are the same. Don't forget good multiple choice questions. It's always good practice. You can sort of go through your answers and see which ones make sense and which ones don't make sense. You can limit your options. Stop at in about 10 or 15 seconds. All right, let's stop at 205. 205. Five more seconds. Guess if you're not sure. When you face one of these problems, and you will. Uh, what I want you to do is, first of all, just think about the pressures and how they're different. So I know that this pressure on this side, because it's pushing this, this level down, that this is the higher of the two pressures. So the atmospheric pressure is bigger than the pressure of the methane. And remember, atmospheric pressure is 100,000 newtons per square meter, 100,000 pascals. So what I'm looking for in the pressure of the methane is a value that is what? Bigger or smaller than one atmosphere? Smaller. How many are there here that are smaller than one atmosphere? There's only one. So if we could just stop right there and we would say the answer has to be B, okay? Because the pressure of the methane has to be smaller than the pressure of the atmosphere. But if you just want to, you know, if you have time at the end and you want to come back and, and calculate what it should be, you would say, well, the pressure is equal to P naught um, minus rho GH minus because this pressure P is less than this pressure P naught. And that's going to be 100,000 minus the density of mercury 
which is 13,600 times 10 times h, which is 0 0.05 meters, and then you would find that that's equal to 93,000 pascals or newtons per square meter. All right. You will have a question where you have to deal with either a manometer or a barometer. This is a manometer. Remember, a barometer, which we use to measure atmospheric pressure, is exactly the same, except one of these pressures is zero. All right. So you'll have one. They work, both work the same way. All right, let's look at Archimedes' principle. Oh, actually, no, before we do that, I want to go back. Because there is something that you could potentially see, and we haven't covered it. And I'm going to send an email out. I just want to make sure it's not a it's not a huge deal, but it's it's kind of an important thing for you folks going on in the MCAT. You might see it on on an assessment coming up, uh, and it's just not a topic that we spend much time on. Have you ever heard of PV diagrams? PV diagrams that describe the pressure. and the volume of a gas as it changes. Chemistry, you under PV diagrams? Maybe? Well, listen, a gas can do work, right? Get where the gases do work. Well, let's say you got an engine with a piston, and you, you explode that gas inside your piston, and it moves your, uh, your piston up, and then it comes back down and it moves up. That gas is doing work as it expands and as it changes volume. We can calculate the work that it does by taking the product of the pressure and the volume. So often physicists and chemists, they'll use a PV diagram where they, they plot out the pressure and volume of a gas. And then from that, they can take this PV diagram and they can calculate the work. And it turns out that the work is equal to, look, we can just do sort of a little, well, let's, I'll just give you this. The work that's done by a gas is equal to the change in the pressure times the change in the volume. Now, if you remember from what we had before, that work was force times displacement, we can see that this is the same, at least dimensionally, and it actually is the same, actually the same, because remember pressure is force over area, and here we have volume. If we think about these units, this is square meters, this is cubic meters. So at least dimensionally, this is the same as force times displacement. That pressure times volume is the same as force times displacement. So whenever I have a gas that is changing pressure and it's changing volume, it has to both change pressure and volume, then that gas is doing work on its environment. These are called PV diagrams. Uh, if you're if you're given a PV diagram and you're asked to find the work, you just find the area under the PV diagram. Let me ask you a question. If you have a PV diagram that looks like this, is that is that gas doing any work? No, it's not doing any work. But if I have a PV diagram that's doing this, is that gas doing any work? It is, actually, I'm sorry, uh, to leave off this delta P here, that you can have a constant pressure as long as your volume is changing. If I have a PV diagram, the work is equal to just the area under that curve. All right. But in this case, if the volume is not changing, and the, but the pressure is changing, that gas is not doing any work because it's not really moving anything, right? It's not causing that piston to expand uh, to a greater volume. It might have an increasing pressure, but because it's not actually moving or increasing the volume, then it's doing no work. Alrighty? You're not going to see this on our test, but this came up when I was looking over the assessment. There was like one question, maybe I think, about PV diagrams. That if I have a changing pressure and our volume, or rather if my volume is changing, uh, then that, that, uh, that gas is doing work. Y'all clear with me on that? All right. Well, let's go on to Archimedes' principle. We saw this in the lab when you were doing the density lab. I think most or all of you that are in the lab anyway that you've seen this already. 
Um, Archimedes principle just describes how a submerged object experiences a buoyant force equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Listen, I like to go to the pool in the summer. Our kids like to swim, and I like to swim too. But uh, you can you can try this if you you can make yourself more and less buoyant. Have y'all ever done this? How do you make yourself more or less buoyant? You do what now? Okay, yeah, you can't stick your stomach out. Do what? Right, you breathe in and breathe out. Because when you breathe in. It's like making a big balloon inside of your chest. You're increasing the volume of the water that you displace, but you're not increasing your weight. And so when you increase the volume of the water that you displace, then that increases the buoyant force, which causes you to shoot up to the top of the water. And then if you let all the air out, then you're decreasing the volume that you're displacing, and then you'll sink to the bottom. Or some of us will sink to the bottom, not that far. Okay? So we can change the volume of our object, and then that changes the amount of displaced fluid. So let's imagine that we have an object here. This object has a certain volume, and I want to figure out now what is the weight of the displaced fluid. So this object displaces a certain amount of fluid. that is equal to its own volume. Right, you measured volume by displacement in the lab. You took that thing, you, you looked at the graduated cylinder and said, oh, we're at 20 milliliters. Then you drop it down into it, like, oh, now we're at 30 milliliters. That means that this object has displaced 10 milliliters of water, and that means that this object has a volume of 10, a milliliter is equal to a what? Do y'all know? Cubic centimeter, right? A cc is a cubic centimeter is a milliliter. Okay, so um, when you measure volume by displacement, the volume that the object displaces is equal to the volume. So when we talk about Archimedes' principle, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid the volume of the displaced fluid is equal to the volume of the object. Let me write that down. So I wrote that in words here. But the volume of the fluid is equal to the volume of the object, at least if it's fully submerged. And we'll see some cases where they're not fully submerged, they're just partially submerged, in which case the volume of the displaced fluid will be whatever fraction of the object that is not that is underwater. Now, the weight of the displaced fluid, this is what Archimedes' principle says, that the buoyant force equals to the weight of the fluid that is displaced. Uh, this is a U. So we can calculate that Fb is equal to the mass of the fluid times g, and the mass of the fluid is equal to, remember our density definition, mass over volume. Our mass of the fluid is equal to the density of the fluid, the volume of the fluid, times g. That's our buoyant force. But look, the volume of the fluid is equal to what? The volume of the object, so or at least the submerged volume of the object. So our buoyant force then, and our expression, this is on your equation sheet, is that Fb is equal to the density of the fluid, the volume of the object, times the acceleration due to gravity. And then that is our, our, uh, our buoyant force. So we'll think about how we can change the buoyant force. We can change the buoyant force in a couple of different ways, apart from moving to a different planet. We can change the density of the fluid. Like, for example, you could go swim in, I don't know, a mercury bath. Yeah, we don't want to do that. But if you did, what would you do? Would you sink or would you float up to the top? 
you would float up to the top. I mean, you would hard, you would you would just sort of lay there on top of it basically, because the density of mercury is so much bigger than the density of water. It's you know 14 times the density of water. And so if you were swimming in mercury, you'd just lay on top of it. You wouldn't actually go into it at all. You might go into it a little bit before you died. But, and then the volume of the object, you could change the volume of the object. Like you could breathe in or you could breathe out. You can change the volume of the object. And then you can also, if you go to another planet, then that will change your uh, buoyant force. Or you could go to the Dead Sea yeah, instead of Mercury, right. Have you seen these pictures of like, it seems like they're all from the 1980s of guys with like, I don't know, really tight swim shorts or something, swimming in the Dead Sea. In the Dead Sea, you know, it has a very high salinity because it's, it's such just below sea level and it just it gets a lot of salt into it. And so because it has a high salinity, a lot of salt in the water, then the density is higher. And so that's why you you float more in the Dead Sea. We talk about apparent weight or apparent mass. I'll call it apparent weight because it's really a force that we're talking about. So imagine that I have an object where the buoyant force is here and the weight is here. The apparent weight, I'll call it Fa, is equal to the weight minus the buoyant force. Now in the case of being fully submerged, if you're fully submerged in water and you're just sort of floating there freely, the buoyant force is bigger, smaller, or the same as your weight. Let me repeat that question. Y'all think. So if you are fully submerged in water, and you're just sort of underneath the surface of the water floating, looking up at the sun or whatever, but you're fully submerged, your buoyant force, what was my question, is it? Right, is it greater than, less than, or equal to your weight? Let's do it as a clicker question, I'll write it down. So is your buoyant force, is the buoyant force greater than the weight? Is it less than the weight? Or is it equal to your weight? If you're floating underneath the surface of the water, is it greater than, less than, or equal? If you're in the swimming pool and you're underneath the surface of the water, you're fully submerged and you're just floating there. You're not zooming up or zooming down, you're just sitting there. Okay, about half of you have the right answer. So I will stop in about five seconds at 45. 45. Okay, awesome. C is the right answer. That if you're just floating, if you're just floating, then that means that your buoyant force has to equal your weight. Otherwise, you'd be zooming up to the top or you'd be zooming down to the bottom. So if your net force is zero, that is if you're just floating, that means that your buoyant force and your weight have to be equal to one another. Right? And in that case, your apparent weight, if you're just floating there, would be equal to what? Be zero, right, if your weight and your buoyant force are the same. All right. Um, Let's see, this also holds that if I only have just partially submerged, but in this case, our buoyant force will equal to um, the density of the fluid times the submerged volume of the object, the submerged volume of the object, times the acceleration due to gravity. Um, we're going to do this next question. Oh shoot, let me see. Let me, I'm going to make up. <coughs> now why don't we stop there?
Let me stop there. We'll go ahead and do the 